see. Dan had a commercial, so I get to have one too. I was in one of the uh, book rooms earlier today and saw Brother Frank Chester's book on liberalism. And I asked James uh, how it was selling, and he said, not too good. So I said, all right, I'll plug it. If you don't uh, have this book, you ought to get it. Frank Chesser preaches in Montgomery, Alabama, and does a tremendous job in that volume. James and Peggy and uh, Tucker come at great expense to themselves and great inconvenience in order to provide us with materials that will help us to know God's word better and to be prepared for eternity. So we urge you to avail yourself of that material. I wish I could take the time to express uh, my heartfelt feelings about this congregation and how Deb and I feel, how thrilled we are to be to be here and to uh, reminisce and you know that uh, as members of this congregation we deeply love you and will always have you deep in our hearts. And those of you who frequent this lectureship and have four years, may God bless you, and I wish I could say more and spend more time expounding upon that. But here is the topic that was assigned to me, and I would like for us to spend the next few minutes exploring one direction on this particular subject. This question, of course, is asked in the Old Testament. Think just a moment about the role of the Old Testament in our lives. We understand that Colossians 2.14 and Hebrews 9.15-17 and many other passages teach that there is a sense in which the Old Testament, certainly the law of Moses, is not applicable to us. We understand that. But there are a host of passages in the New Testament. Romans 15.4, 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17, 1 Corinthians 10, verses 6 and 11, and a host of other passages that tell us that, as a matter of fact, the Old Testament has direct relevance to us. Do you remember Peter, for example, wrote in 1 Peter chapter 1, quoting from Leviticus 11, that you and I are to be holy, like God is holy. So not only does the Old Testament have relevance to you and me because it brings the scheme of redemption to culmination, lots of prophecies about Jesus, but, but that's not all. We learn a lot of other things in the Old Testament that have immediate and pertinent relevance to us. And is it not the case that one of the things that the Old Testament does for us, I suggest to you probably more than the New Testament, is that it depicts for us the nature, the attributes, the essence, the character of God. And brethren, I'm convinced, I'm human, my perspective can be wrong and it certainly changes. But I'm convinced that one of the central areas of confusion in the church and even out here in the world in our day is the fact that most people have a defective view of deity. They don't understand who God is. And I'm telling you more uh, perhaps than even the New Testament, the Old Testament, really goes after making us acquainted with who God is. We need to spend some time there to make certain that we are familiar with the God of the Bible, not the God that so many people claim to be following. Genesis 18.25, of course, is that context where God sent angelic beings down to uh, this planet in order to survey the uh, moral landscape of the cities of the plain, And whenever Abraham learned that uh, God's intention was to wipe out these cities where he had relatives, you remember he asked God if he would be willing to spare those cities if there are at least 50 righteous souls. And that's when he asked this pertinent question, will not the judge of all the earth do right? Surely God would not destroy the good people along with the wicked. Of course, this is a rhetorical question, isn't it? The answer is inbuilt. So here is a tremendous statement made by Abraham that zeroes in on a central feature of the very nature and essence of God, his righteousness. What is God's righteousness in the Bible? It refers to his rightness. 
That is the fact that he is, he is fair, he is impartial, he is absolutely just. There are many attributes that God possesses. Each one of them thrills us to our very core. But surely this one ought to cause us to be deeply grateful for who God is. You're aware over and over and over, I've just listed a few of the passages where this expression, this phrase is used. God is no respecter of persons. We ought to be thankful for that. God is going to be fair in His treatment of us. He always has been. God has always done right. You cannot pick a moment in human history where God mistreated anyone or favored one person above another or conducted Himself in some way that reflected upon His integrity. Not once. God's behavior, God's conduct has always been absolutely impeccable, correct, Anybody dispute that? Do you doubt it? Unlike the way we often treat each other, God has always treated people properly. So we begin in the garden. Isn't the grace of God manifested in that, at that moment in time? I mean, God lovingly brings into existence the first human beings, fashions the first man out of the dust of the ground, and then the woman out of him, and gently places them in a beautiful garden. Isn't that the grace of God? That's paradise, Eden. Every need supplied. God's a gracious, kind, courteous, and compassionate being. But you remember how they disobeyed his instructions. Was God being kind and fair when he said, you can eat of all of these trees, just don't eat this one? Anything inappropriate about that? Was God wrong to put such a restriction on people? You know the answer to that. And when they violated that law, and I'm certain that God must have forgiven them if they were penitent. The text doesn't really go into detail about that. But you and I know if they were, they were forgiven. But they were permanently booted out of that garden and there was nothing they could ever do or say to change that predicament. Question, did the judge of all the earth do right there? You mean they could never go back, no matter what they did to try to rectify their sin? You remember they had children. Those boys received instruction from God. We are informed that after they performed their sacrificial actions, God had respect for Abel's sacrifice, but he did not have respect for Cain. God rejected that young man's sacrifice. Question. Why? Was God showing favoritism toward Abel over Cain? Was God being unfair to Cain? Oh no, look at verse 7 in the text. Here we are informed that God actually spoke to him and said, if you do right. I think the King James says well, doesn't it? Notice that that word means there was information, there was a standard, there was a framework that had been communicated by God. It's not like God just one day said, you know, I don't, I don't like what you're doing, but I like what he's doing, so I'll accept you and I'll reject you. God's never done that. These boys were given pre-information. They were uh, previously informed and prepared graciously by God. And even after Cain did wrong, God said, look, I want to accept you. I will accept you. Just do right. What's the problem here? You remember 1 John chapter 3 gets very specific. Why did, why did Cain ultimately kill his brother? Committed murder. Human history's first. Because your own deeds were evil. 
and your brothers were righteous. Do you remember what happened to Cain as a result of that? God placed a curse upon him, made a fugitive and a vagabond, apparently for the rest of his life. Question, did the judge of all the earth do right in his treatment of that boy? We move on down in Bible history. For example, Genesis 6 through 9, you remember all of those people on that planet at that time. We don't know how many, but there there must have been a lot. I'm confident there were at least millions. I've told you, have I not, in previous sessions that Ray Winkle's book written back in the 50s called The Flood, where he sits down and calculates how many people would have been on earth at the time, taking into account the distance, uh, the time frame from creation to the flood, the extended uh, lifespans of the patriarchal period, All of the other things that are taken into account to calculate the world's population, he said there were between 11 and 12 billion people, potentially. And you remember the details. I don't have to go through the details of this passage, but these people were were disobedient. Verses 5 and following describe their spiritual condition as being uh, one in which their thoughts were evil continually. Well, you remember... God was long-suffering. Do you know that word is used twice in the New Testament in 1 Peter chapter 3 and 2 Peter chapter 3? In, a con- both, in both places, the context is the flood. In, in fact, the way Peter put it in 1 Peter 3 is God waited. Isn't that a neat concept? God waits on people. He waits. He is long-suffering. That is, He suffers long. You and I don't. <laughs> We're quick to condemn each other, oftentimes prematurely without sufficient evidence because someone said it. That's not God. He waits and he waits and he waits. There's the grace of God, the love of God, the mercy of God. Romans chapter 2, the long-suffering of God ought to lead people to repentance, but you remember... He brought upon this planet a global deluge that completely flooded the planet and cleansed the earth of its human population with the exception of eight people. In fact, chapter 8 says they were destroyed from the earth. I mean wiped out. We're faced with the same question. Did the judge of all the earth do right? Now, wait a minute. We're talking about God drowning perhaps billions of people. Did he do right? Genesis chapter 19, when the context in which this statement is is taking place, you remember, here are these wicked cities. There are apparently five cities in this area called the cities of the plain. And you remember the description. We typically think of them as being a little more wicked than maybe some of the other contexts in Bible history, but it is true that some of their behavior was so unnatural that it is depicted as abomination. But you remember that uh, as Abraham continued his interaction with God, he worked from 50 down to 10. If there are just 10... Will you spare the cities? And God said, I certainly will. I'd like to know why Abraham ceased the conversation. I presume it's because he thought there were ten. But in chapter 19, you remember, there were not ten. Not even ten. And so God rained down out of the atmosphere burning sulfur that so thoroughly destroyed and devastated that part of the world that to this day, Archaeologists are in disagreement with themselves as to the location of those cities. No one really knows. There's speculated. There's theories conflicting with each other. Those cities were so thoroughly destroyed that for all practical purposes, they never even existed. Question, did the judge of all the earth do right? We harmonize such conduct with God's love and God's mercy and God's kindness. We move down to the book of Exodus. We're going to skip a lot of passages in the Bible, a lot of context. 
You move on into the book of Exodus, you remember God sent Moses. Go talk to Pharaoh. Tell him what I want you to tell him. Warn him. Have you noticed that? God doesn't ever lower the boom on someone without giving them the benefit of the doubt. He always warns. God's word is a manifestation of his grace. He gives people an opportunity to weigh and consider the issues involved. But you remember they were just flat obstinate. Not only Pharaoh, but the whole population. Obstinate, stubborn, and rebellious. God brought upon them ten devastating plagues. We teach our children these in uh, Bible stories all the time, Sunday morning. We're all familiar with them. Imagine being there and enduring every one of those afflictions, catastrophic. Those were not pleasant. People died. And ultimately, the whole military of Pharaoh was drowned in the Red Sea. Did the judge of all the earth do right throughout those incidents? Exodus chapter 32, moving ahead quickly at Mount Sinai with the giving of the law. You remember Moses is told by God, descend. People are breaking the commandments. When he and Joshua approach the encampment and see what's taking place, graphic description, they're dancing, their revelry is going on. Uh, the Hebrew idiom that's used is they sat down to eat, to eat and drink, rose up to play. And there's no telling what all they were doing. But apparently a sizable percentage of the population is involved in the party. God threatened to destroy the entire congregation. Fresh out of Egypt. And God's ready to just put an end to the bulk of the, of the entire nation. As it turned out, the execution detail that was put together by Moses executed about 3,000 of those fellow Israelites on the spot. They passed through that population and began killing people, their own people, their own countrymen. Same question. Did the judge of all the earth do right on that occasion? Did he endorse this conduct instigated by the leader, Moses? We come to the book of Numbers. You know, Numbers is a fascinating book. Acts 7, Hebrews 4, other passages in the New Testament seem to indicate that in a lot of ways, the book of Numbers parallels Christian existence. You know, they came out of Egypt, we come out of Egypt, the bondage of sin. They crossed uh, the Red Sea, we cross the waters of immersion. In fact, that's referred to as a baptism in 1 Corinthians 10. And we are on our way to cross the Jordan and enter into the promised land. The Jordan, in much of our terminology, symbolism of our songs and so forth, I don't have to cross Jordan alone. You know, on Jordan's stormy banks, you know, that's death. And then the promised land of Hebrews uh, chapter 4, the, the rest that yet remains is heaven. So a lot of imagery and symbolism. So in many ways, that period between the exodus and the crossing of the sea and entering into the promised land is just like life in the church of Christ. We need to spend a lot of time in this book, I'm telling you, because we can learn a lot about God, and we can learn a lot about ourselves, too. And I wish I could say it was a pretty picture, but it's not a pretty picture. For example, in chapter 11, we're just going to hit the highlights. In chapter 11, the complaining that goes on. And we don't typically think that's that bad. You know, murder, adultery, homosexual, but, but complaining? Come on. There's things that happen every day that, that test our uh, patience, and we complain. God caused fire to burn among them. They named the place Tabira, which means burning. God burned some of his own people to death. Was that right for him to do? Same chapter. They keep craving, they're craving something to eat, they're whining about it. The text says God caused a very great, that's the terminology, plague to proceed in its afflicting of the population. They named that place Kibroth Hata'ava, that is graves of craving, because that's where they buried a lot of the population. 
because of their craving for things that God had not chosen to provide them with, but which they yearned for, no doubt because of the fact that they were used to it in their uh, habitations in Egypt. Did God do right in killing all those people? The pattern continues throughout this book. Chapter 12, Miriam, Moses' own sister, in league with Aaron, challenged Moses' uh, role as leader. That's not really what was bothering them. There's another attribute. You know, the Bible is the psychology book on the planet. Now it is. The creator of the human mind has provided us with a book that explains to us our minds, our spirits. The text is very clear. They used a pretense. Many times when people bring up things, well, you know, you did this and you did this, that's not what's bothering them. There's ulterior motives, there's an agenda, there's something else that's bothering them. In their case, they were upset about who he married. That's not what they said. They didn't tell Moses that. You remember how God dealt with that? Apparently Miriam, even though Aaron participated, was the ringleader in that one. She was the instigator. God struck her with this permanent skin disease that is, it's terminal. And whenever... uh, Her brother begged for God that she might not die of that, but be cleansed. He permitted that to be the case, but then he says at the very least, she's going to go through the uh, typical mosaic requirement of being placed outside the camp for seven days. Can you imagine the public humiliation connected with that? In fact, you know what the nation was supposed to be doing? They're supposed to be traveling to the promised land. So the entire nation brought to a screeching halt while they wait for her to go through the purification process. Did the judge of all the earth do right in the way he treated her? We move on to chapter 13. Here they are, southernmost boundaries of the promised land. They assemble a reconnaissance team, one leading individual from each of the 12 tribes. These 12 spies go forth. Optimistic hopes for the future. They remain gone over a month. They finally come back. Ten of them say, we can't do it. And the bulk of the population bought it. They bought it. You remember what happened? God said, Moses, Aaron, you fellas step right over there. I'm going to put an end to this whole bunch. Second time, he threatened to destroy the entire congregation. Instead, you remember the ten spies died. And the rest of the congregation of adults, that's anyone over 19, doomed to wander aimlessly in the desert one year for every day those spies were in the land. Can you imagine wandering around in circles in a very arid, rugged, hot, desolate portion of the world for 40 years, a whole nation? Did the judge of all the earth do right there? We move to chapter 16. Kor, Dathan, and Abiram. They have significant roles in the congregation, but not enough for them. They want want more influence, more prestige, more popularity. They're joined by 250 leading council members. Together they conspire against uh, Moses and therefore against God simply to enhance their standing and their credibility and acceptance Uh, within the congregation. Why? Why would people do that in a local church? What motivates us? Where are we coming from? Ambition? Prestige? Power? Control? All that comes to what? Pride. Ultimately, that's it. I want to advance myself. It's for me. People any different today? Are we any different? You ought to read this text. Read this chapter. It describes circumstances that I have seen in church after church after church over the years. People have not changed one bit. There's always an angle. There's something someone's wanting, an agenda, and they cover it with camouflage. And usually that's slick enough that lots of people buy it. Well, do you remember what happened? 
In chapter 16, verse 11, God nailed this. Here's what he called it. You know, whatever the politics and who's involved and what the immediate pretense is, here's what it actually is. They're gathering against the Lord. We don't ever see it that way. Because personalities are involved, and that's where the focus is. But that's that's not how God viewed it. Look at their MO, method of operation. Cocky attitude, verse 12. Misrepresenting the past and the future, verse 13. Jealousy and guilty of the very things they accuse other people of. And blaming the leaders for the failures of the people. Study these attributes and these qualities that these men demonstrated and see if they do not operate even among us. You know, depending upon how charismatic and how persuasive these individuals are, they can sometimes sway large numbers of people, people you would never dream would be sucked into such things. In this case, Korah primarily was sufficiently slick and conniving that he managed to draw into this the entire congregation. (laughs) Isn't that incredible? That boggles my mind. You remember what happened. Moses tried to stop this thing. And you want to see a tremendous chapter in um, spiritual leadership qualities. Go back and read chapter 16 and study this carefully. Courage to confront, but humility. Willingness to draw a line and an ability to teach and reason with people. That was Moses. Demonstrated several wonderful leadership attributes. They didn't work. He was not successful, but at least he maintained his integrity before God. There's evidence, of course, being a human. We sometimes don't realize that. These great men and women of God were human. He felt loneliness, insecurity, anger, rejection, a deep sense of hurt. You know how God chose to handle it? Moses, Aaron, (laughs) you faithful, step over there. I'm going to put it in. That's number three. Three times God has said, I'm going to wipe out the whole nation. Question. When Korah, Dathan, and Abiram were swallowed, Remember the ground vibrated, seismic activity split open, swallowed those men and those of their family that sided with them, and then sent fire down from the atmosphere. When does when that happen? We didn't talk about Leviticus 10. And burned all 250 of those leading prominent individuals in the, in the congregation. To death did the judge of all the earth do right. Do you know within 24 hours, the very next day, the people that survived all that, but having been eyewitnesses of what had taken place, began complaining and griping and once again blaming the wrong people. You know what God did? It is so easy in the midst of congregational turmoil to place erroneous blame and to fail to see who is defending right and who is wrong. If you could go back in time and sit down in a time machine and step out there in in, uh, that portion of the world and just kind of get to know people and meet the members of uh, the Israelite congregation and find out what they're like, their personalities, and try to figure out what makes people tick and why did so many people think this was what was going on and others said, no, this is what's going on. You think you could get to the bottom of it? Think you could figure it out? Well, it is clear from these passages that God expects you to. There aren't any excuses for misassessing a situation and then going off to compound your spiritual misassessment by acting on it. There are no excuses. God expects us to exercise sufficient spiritual sense to sort out the truth and decide with what is right. Remember how Jesus put it in John 7, 24? Dealing with a very technical matter of the law. He said, judge righteous judgment. That is, you have an obligation to assess a situation, scripture or whatever, and make certain that you have understood accurately what's going on here. We have the divine obligation to do so. On this occasion... 
Now remember, yesterday 250 were destroyed by fire and three men and a lot of relatives were swallowed by the ground. The people then turn around and say, well, you know, we don't like the way this went down. God says, all right, Moses, Aaron, move over. Number four, the God of the universe threatened for the fourth time to destroy the congregation. This time, God caused a plague to commence movement through the population. 14,700 people died before Moses could scramble and implement atonement procedures. 14,700 people. Did the judge of all the earth do right on that occasion? Numbers 20. The congregation again gathers against the leaders. Why? Well, their comfort level was being challenged again. Chapter 20, verses 3 and 4. Read this chapter. It's just like what we go through. Daily stress, daily irritations. Do you understand the Bible teaches those things measure our spiritual stamina? They're not just coincidental or side points. They have to do with what's involved in living the Christian life the way God would have us to. Physical discomfort, in fact, tests critical qualities of spirituality, self-control, patience, and ultimately faith itself. How much faith do we really have in trusting God in life? Well, Moses on this occasion allowed the carping to get to him. You remember what he did? He struck the rock. And God said two things to him. You didn't believe me. And you didn't hallow me. Now that's the same thing that he said in Leviticus 10 on the occasion of the death of Nadab and Abihu. You know, your conduct, the way you've chosen to deal with this situation has failed to show me as God to be the holy, separate, distinct being that I am. Do you all understand that our conduct in dealing with each other reflects on God? And we will give an account for that. We're responsible for that. Well, you remember, even though Moses had worked with God to bring Israel out of Egypt, even though he went through 38 years of desert meandering, endured all the hardships of desert life, the incessant rebellion and complaining of his own countrymen, I mean, Moses was a great man. And yet, on this occasion, because of this action, God banned he and his brother permanently from ever entering the promised land. We have to ask the question again. Do you think God did right? Was that appropriate for him to react that way? Numbers 21, the people become discouraged. The reason given is the harsh traveling conditions. So, once again, they spoke against God and Moses. Remember what they said about the manna, which was a gracious act of God to see, th see them through these desert wanderings. Described in uh, Exodus 16 as a sweet, honey-like wafer. They said, this is worthless bread. We're sick of this. Well, this time God sent poisonous snakes, venomous. Chapter 21, 6 says many, that's the Bible word. Not a few, but many of the people of Israel died from lethal snake bite. Did God do right on that occasion? What kind of a God would do that? The atheist would say that's proof that that you all have a vindictive, vicious God. Is that what we think? Is that a legitimate assessment, is the question. Or do we need to adjust our understanding? Do we need to, have, do we need to be able to conceptualize all of these features and all of these circumstances in such a way that we understand God is right? Chapter 25, here's the final stop before Canaan. 
And I mean, <laughs> it goes from bad to worse. This is where the Moabites gather and suck the, a number of the Israelites in to their religious worship activities. Do we have any problem in the Church of Christ with illicit worship activities right now? That's what they were doing. That's all they were doing. Pagan worship, religious worship, typically in antiquity included sexual activity. But it was all in the name of religion. It was worship. God's anger was again aroused. The offending leaders were publicly executed, hung before the congregation, right out there in plain sight. And our people today would say that's cruel and unusual punishment. In chapter 25, verse 8, you remember Phinehas, while the whole congregation's out there mourning over this execution and, and what, how they've been drawn into all of this, you remember Phinehas sees this Israelite man and Moabite woman, and they go into a tent, and I guess he figures what's about to happen. So he gets a spear, follows them into the tent, and it's clear from the grammar that with one thrust he kills both of them. Showing no concern for his own safety or the unpleasantness of the task. You think he enjoyed doing that? That wouldn't be a fun thing. Courageous, alert, vigilant. Notice he didn't care to hash out the situation with endless discussions and multiple meetings. He assessed the situation quickly, scripturally, accurately, and then had the courage to stand up and act. That's the kind of leadership the Lord needs today. It hasn't changed. Nothing's changed. People are the same. Look at God's assessment of his action. This is all in Numbers 25. I challenge us to go read it, breathe it in. The text says that, among other things, when he went in there and did that, he turned back God's wrath from the nation. Do you think God feels any wrath toward any congregations today? Is there any relevance in what we're seeing here and the lives that we live as members of the Lord's body? Number two, the text says he possessed God's zeal. Wouldn't you like to have that on your tombstone? You know, God possesses the attribute of zeal. This is closely aligned with the word a jealous, zealous and jealous are very closely aligned in the Old Testament. You know, it's a burning passion that is so deep and so urgent and so intense that it insists on seeing that what is right is accomplished. God said, Phinehas, you're just like me on that. Number three, his action served in God's sight as kind of an atoning act for the rest of the nation. Three incredible things attributed to this man because of this extremely violent and independent. You know, we'd say, this guy is wacko, he is out of control. But he was closer to God at that moment in his life than anybody else in the nation was. When courageous, godly members of the local church have the guts and the spiritual insight to rise up and fight against sinister forces that are operating within the congregation, they are helping to save that congregation. We don't look at it that way. We ought not to vilify them, believe false rumors about them, or accuse them of rebelling against authority. Despite this valiant, righteous action that Phinehas took, remember this was the grandson, grandnephew of Moses, 24,000 people died that day. If he had not made atonement by his action, there's no telling how many people would have died. 24,000. Can you grasp that? Twenty-four thousand. Ask you a question. Remember how many people died in nine one one? 
People always inflate things initially. 266 in the four airliners that crashed, 2,283 in the Twin Towers for a total of 2,549. That's the final tally. Remember how traumatic that was? To all of us. You know, those scenes of those two towers smoking and then dropping are going to haunt us the rest of our lives, aren't they? Question, how many people die every day in this country? You have any idea? Of course, the 2002 is not out. 2001, I took the total figure. It's just America now. We're not talking about the rest of the world. Just America. You know what that number is? Nearly three times what died that day. Every day in this nation alone, over 6,000 people are being ushered into eternity unprepared. How many died that day in the nation of Israel? 24,000. Who did that? God. Not terrorists. Look at chapter 26 of Numbers. Remember this book is called Numbers because of a numbering, a census that was taken at the beginning of the 40-year wandering and one near the end. Look at the last one, Numbers 26. It's incredible. 1.2 million people had died in the intervening years. 1.2 million. An entire generation of people. Did the judge of all the earth do right on that? You and I cannot, we're having trouble grasping the two or three thousand that died that day in those towers. How can, you gra how can your mind conceptualize 1.2 million people? Remember Elijah, let's jump way ahead. 1 Kings 18. Spectacular confrontation of the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. You remember the details? You remember at first, you know, they're non-committal. He's saying, come on, make a decision here. Here's God, here's Baal, who's it going to be? And they're like, nobody wants to commit. They didn't. But boy, when that fire came down and burned all, everything that was lined up there, you remember how they quickly spoke out, Jehovah's God, Jehovah. They were, remember what, you remember what Elijah said? At that moment, he said, I want you to take all 450 prophets of Baal and these 400 other prophets, and I want you to take them down to the valley, and I want you to execute every one of them. Slaughter them. Did the judge of all the earth do right? 850 false religious representatives. Slaughter them. And he made the population do it, God's people. Israelite people had a checkered history. We could go on and on with this. Let's jump ahead. As you just look from 1500 B.C. right on through the rest of the Old Testament, 1500 years, pretty checkered history, isn't it? Let's just cut to the chase. What happened? What did God finally do with his own people? Ten-twelfths of them, the ten northern tribes, were sent into Assyrian captivity basically permanently. That's it. Look at the statement that assesses this in 2 Kings 17. The Lord was very angry with Israel, and he removed them from his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah alone. That's 10 of the 12 tribes. Sent them packing, those that weren't killed by the Assyrians, sent them packing into Assyrian captivity. And for all practical purposes, that's all the rest of the Old Testament has to say about them. You remember the uh, southern tribal groups, Judah, Benjamin, known as Judah, lasted a little bit longer, but look what finally happened to them. And look at the terminology that inspiration uses. The Lord rejected all the descendants of Israel, that is Jacob, afflicted them, delivered them into the hand of plunderers until he had cast them from his sight. You know the question. Here is God's own people rejecting him. And he rejected them. Did he do right? Someone says, that's Old Testament. That's before Jesus and grace. God wouldn't do that today. Isn't that the sentiment that we have prevailing, even in the church? 
Well, okay. Let's go to the New Testament. Look at the first church of Christ on earth, city of Jerusalem, Acts 5. You remember they were trying to handle a benevolence matter to involve widows, Hellenistic widows, uh, Jews, Greek-speaking Jews, and then Hebrew-speaking, Aramaic-speaking Jews. Little problem there they were trying to sort out. Uh, that's in chapter 6. Prior to that, it's just that we got so many members of the church from so many different countries that haven't gone back home that we need to pool some of our resources to make it possible for uh, God's people to be cared for and provided for. So... A husband and wife decided to participate in this very worthwhile project. They had a piece of land, a piece of property, which they chose to sell, and they decided to give some, perhaps most, of the, of the money that they received, but they, they decided, let's just go ahead and tell the apostle we're giving everything that we got for the property. And you know that they didn't have to sell the property at all to begin with. That was their choice. And when they decided, well, we do want to sell this to help out, it, they could have decided, but we're only going to give, you know, 50%, 60%, 20%, or 80%. Their choice, that's fine. They didn't want to give it all. They chose not to give it all, but they wanted to get credit, I guess, credit for all of it. If you remember what happened, Ananias was the first one to be confronted Peter said, you've, you've let Satan fill your heart. Has that happened to any of us? And then Peter said, you're not lying to men, but to God. Wait, wait a minute, time. I thought Ananias went to the apostles and said, we, gave, we got this much money for selling this property, and here's that total amount. Sound to me like he was lying to men. Who else would you lie to? Oh, every lie that's told by God's people is directed toward other people. But Peter's making the point you need to understand. You're lying to God. That's how it's going to go down. Ananias fell down dead on the spot. The judge of all the earth do right there. This is New Testament, you know. Under grace. I don't know where his wife was. Some hours later, she comes in unaware of anything that's happened. She doesn't even know her husband's dead. Peter asked her directly, did you sell the land for the amount that your husband said you sold it for? Yes, sir. She confirmed her husband's lie. And you remember what the text says. He said very simply to her, the people, the very ones that buried your husband are at the door. They're going to carry you out too. She dropped dead on the spot. You know what those two people did? is nothing compared to what I've seen my own brethren do in lying and scheming and conniving. That's nothing compared to what a number of liberal churches are doing in deceiving and causing people to go off into apostasy with all of these bizarre worship actions and claiming this is all spiritual, this is all God's will. That's a lie! And don't tell me God doesn't feel the same way about that as He felt about them. He may not be striking a person dead today, although He may be. There's no indication that God doesn't do that anymore. He doesn't commit miracles. But He's still working. And I'm telling you, God has not changed. And we are not in the grip of grace. That's another lie. That's Calvinism. The New Testament teaches the grace and love and compassion of God, but people are teaching it and distorting it in such a way that everything I've said tonight makes no sense. The 
God is not going to pretty much accept everyone. In fact, the Bible teaches even in churches that are known for remaining biblically sound. Oh, they're conservative. What's God going to do when members connive and scheme and lie? Will the judge of all the earth do right? You know he will. It may not be in our timetable and how we think it ought to be done, but you can mark it down. Indeed, God cannot overlook or brush aside flagrant infractions of His will. He cannot do it and still be God. The righteousness of God, the justice of God, cannot simply overlook unresolved sin. He can't do it. God can be counted on to be consistent in His handling of sin. How might you and I avoid the consequences of our own actions and avert the wrath of God? Well, you know the answer to that. Here's the grace of God. He's made it possible for us to be forgiven. If we're not Christians, we are without hope in the world. But if you will obey the gospel of Christ, if you will understand what He wants you to do, what He requires you to do to satisfy the wrath, you know the New Testament word there is propitiation, you must hear the good news, believe it, repent of your sins, confess Christ, be immersed for the remission of sins. How often do we preach and teach, proclaim that throughout the land, and it falls on deaf ears? And how many of those people Take their refuge. No, I don't agree with that. Baptism is not out. But I believe in the grace of God. And I believe He's going to take care of me. Will the judge of all the earth do right on that? Indeed, an individual who fails to comply with this simple plan of salvation will be rejected at the judgment. The judge of all the earth is going to do right. Those of us who are Christians, we may think we can wilf willfully violate God's rules, and He's going to be lenient with us. But, wait a minute, God's no respecter of persons. God doesn't love you more than He loves someone else. Do you think God loves you more than someone else? God can't do that and be God. So rather than me thinking, well, you know, I'm just one among many then, I ought to be thinking, I, that's incredible that God loves me as much as he loves anybody else that's ever lived. But there are no exceptions. He's not going to treat me more lenient and say, well, I'm going to cut you some slack. Yeah, generally speaking, people have to be immersed, but... I'll make an exception in your case. Mm -mm -mm. Not going to happen. We don't understand who God is if we think that can happen. That's not the God of the Bible. Christians, even preachers and elders, who have said and done things that are evil and wicked, Christians who have told bald-faced lies, who really are acting no different than the alien sinner out here that's never even named the name of Christ. You think God's going to treat those differently? Well, I'm a member of the Church of Christ, and I attend Sunday and Wednesday, and, you know, that makes me a cut above, and therefore, he's not going to be as strict with me. I can do things and get away with it. I believe we think that. You know all those instances that we looked at, beginning in Exodus, were God's people. We didn't even talk about what God was doing to the pagan Gentile world out there. And I assure you, both biblical and extra-biblical evidence shows that God has destroyed a lot more civilization than just Sodom and Gomorrah. That was not an isolated incident. The prophets speak of desolation that has been wreaked by God, perpetrated many times in human history.
Can they be acceptable to God in that condition? We're talking about Christians, aren't we? Folks, we've got to fit this together. One of the concerns I had about this, this lesson is that it, it may be so top-heavy that I somehow leave you with misimpressions about how God's grace and compassion actually do work. Forgive me if I've left a misimpression with you. It's not my intention, but it does seem to me that there is such a prominent misconception that prevails today that we need to go back and stress the righteousness, the justice of God. We must harmonize this righteous judge with our understanding of the compassion and the love and the mercy of God. The general tendency for us is to so stress the love and mercy of God that for all practical purposes we just ignore all of these passages that clearly illustrate the justice of God. Tell me, why didn't God record more instances in Numbers and other passages of more positive interaction with His people? Answer that. Isn't the Bible answer to that? Because God was reacting to people. <laughs> this is how most of God's people have conducted themselves throughout history. Don't blame God for that. Don't say, you know, man, when you really statistically start looking through Bible history century after century, God's been pretty negative with people. Don't blame that on God. He made us free moral agents. And we cannot blame anyone but ourselves when He responds to us in accordance with the way He said He would. He loves us dearly. And He's done everything He can do. Do you understand that? We've got this welfare mentality, spiritual welfare mentality that's taken over the church in the same way that physically it's taken over our society. It's not my fault. God needs to do everything for me. Isn't that right? Well, listen, God's done everything for us. He's done everything redemptively, and He continues to do everything providentially for us. But we cannot look at all of those wonderful blessings and conclude, okay then, even though He's told me, don't lie, I can still do that. It won't work. And it will not go down in eternity in that way. And so as Christians... We can receive the benefits of Jesus' blood on a continuing basis. 1 John chapter 1. Ongoing. Yes? But we must ever strive to remain pure in heart and motives. We must correct our mistakes and repent. If we continue on persistent in a perspective that is flat wrong, God's not going to wave that aside and say, well, it didn't matter. We will give an account, and God will be loving and just in His assessment. When we're drawn into sin, we must not puff up and entrench ourselves in pride and self-interest. We must humble ourselves and get our thinking straight. We cannot say, well, no, God's grace will see me through this even if I don't do that. That's not true. You know, God's grace is seen in the simple fact that He's even willing to forgive us. We don't deserve that. So therefore, we conclude, well, the fact that God's willing to forgive, well then, okay, I'm going to be forgiven. It really doesn't matter what I do. I'm telling you, there are more people perhaps in the Lord's church that believe you can't fall from grace than there are out here that we've typically said believe it. In fact, the sermon that I'm preaching tonight would turn the stomachs of most people 
in the liberal, liberal churches of our brotherhood, wouldn't it? They would want to run me off this stage so fast and say, you don't understand the grace of God, you are legalistic, you are mean-spirited, and on and on and on. Well, if they're right, brethren, I want to be taught. I want to be taught. But you're going to have to explain to me the whole Bible, which I've just hit the high points. I'm telling you, I skipped passage after passage after passage that makes the same point. If you can harmonize these passages for me, for me to have a more accurate understanding, I will be deeply grateful to you. There is no alternative. The nature and character of God are unalterable. He's just, he's impartial, he is fair. Praise God. In fact, you and I ought to thank him, praise him, magnify him, and bow humbly before him for many reasons but especially tonight because he is the judge of all the earth who will always do right. If you need to come tonight and get your spiritual life right with the judge of the universe, will you do that as we stand and sing together? Amen.